to hear from the coach. Brought to you by Shamrock Office Solutions. It's Marty Clark, and uh, it's, they're never easy here in Las Vegas. As uh, Portland made it tough on you there in the first half. Probably the best I've seen Portland play all year long for that the opening 20 minutes. Yeah, they um, they mixed things around a little bit. I go on a bit of boxing one, and then went some triangle on two. Obviously, trying look like look like they were just trying to deny the point guards the ball back when when they got rid of it and. Uh, uh, probably upset our rhythm a little bit. We didn't shoot it very well, and we turned it over way too much in the first half. And uh, yeah, they played. I mean, as I said before the game, they got nothing to lose. They're out there to play, and you know, each game for them now is a is a bonus. And um, they can be dangerous teams. Jazz Johnson. I mean, I just, well, I mean, listen, he put him on their on his back for a while there. Twenty six points. He's really tough to stop, especially when he gets ahead of steam going and when he's motivated the way he was tonight. Yeah, I mean, uh, really part of his. Uh, his way of play is just to jump into you and um, make the referees make a call. And if they don't make a call, well, that's too bad. If they do, then that's that's a bonus. But he actually made the shot today. It wasn't like he was just flinging at the ring. He was trying to get the ball on the hoop and, and get the foul. And I, I'm not sure how many free throws he ended up shooting, but he did a really nice job of putting our defenders under pressure. Um, well, I think you knew you, you'd have the, the advantage here inside in this one, and, and Jock certainly took advantage, and Dane had a really nice game as well with 11 points and six rebounds. 19 and 12 for Jock Landale. It, it just doesn't seem like, I mean, it seems like he kind of wore them down as this game went on. Yeah, and that uh, and that was that was a plan. It didn't sort of eventuate till later in the game, but you know, just pound the thing inside. Um, it doesn't matter what defense they're trying to throw at you because in the end it, it's all a bit of smoke and mirrors, really. You, you, they have to do something to try and stop him a touching it, and then b if he does yeah. touch it, you know, try and limit his influence in the game. And in the end, we were able to um, we were able to get in there and put him in a position to score rather than him have to make a move to score. And uh, he did a really nice job of converting. When you look at this box score and you see 27 threes taken in a game that you want to get the ball inside, you know, I, I, you don't look at that obviously black and white. You look at the film and you see that you had 38 points in the paint yeah. and plenty of touches in the paint as well. But of those 27 threes, do you feel like most of those came in rhythm or were some of those maybe forced? Uh, there was a couple early I thought were no, early in the clock. They're just shots we wouldn't normally take. I mean, uh, I'm not talking about the transition stuff. Fine, no problem. You're, you're on the run. Calvin's on the run. Or we want to throw it up and, and shoot it. That's not a, not an issue. But when we started throwing it to Jock, and then Jock starts throwing it back out, the other shots we're really looking for. And that's um, you know, the guys on the other side of the floor are always going to beneficiary of of us throwing into Jock because he's a good passer. You know, he finds people if they if they're going to double team or if they'll start to play as they're playing a triangle or two at one stage, and we could overload the other side. So Jock. And his man and another defender means it's two on one on the backside, and um, yeah, it, it, you know, it's, a, it's not a not a defense we've seen before, and probably not one that gets used very much anymore. But um, once the players sort of got a feel for what what to expect, then you know it, it's open shots. And I say twenty seven threes is probably a lot, but it, the ball did go inside a lot too. I thought Kyle Clark had a really big impact yep. on this game in the first half. I mean, he came out and did the same things that he was doing last year that made him yep. so effective. Uh, I mean, was this one of those games where you look at the matchups and you say this is somewhere where we could use Kyle Clark and, and you know, he may be able to take care of some things? Uh, yeah, and that was uh, – I mean, obviously, Gabe Taylor's a good matchup for him. It's a similar size, and uh, I thought Kyle did a really nice job on him. And uh, He hit a three himself, he grabbed some rebounds, and, you know, we know he can do it. He's done it – beginning of the year and uh, in the end Dane playing at the four sort of cut into his minutes but <clears throat> but he's a, he's a good for us I think offensively it, it's good to have Kyle out there and uh, he's a space of the floor and you know he doesn't turn over just does what he needs to do he can hit an open shot and grab a rebound and yeah he, he did a really good job for us. Calvin Herman had 21 points tonight but it, it looked like he did a really nice job of letting the game come to yeah. him. Yeah absolutely I mean it, it wasn't too forced and said he gets his on all different levels, he gets him in transition. He can, he can get him on the rim, and we ran some plays, and he got layups, and uh, then he can step out and shoot. And, and going back to the point, if if Jock Landau touches the ball, Calvin and Tanner will be the two that will be on the back end of uh, the pass back out of the post. It's kind of a rough night for Joe. Is he? I mean, he's just kind of on the bench with four fouls there, in in foul trouble down stretch in the second half. Maybe a good night to limit him to the twenty nine oh, minutes. Maybe, but he had a handful yeah. with Jazz Johnson, especially yeah. like we said the way he was playing tonight. Yeah, I mean he has, obviously hasn't practiced for a week and he's a little bit out of rhythm. But I, I didn't think he played badly. Um, you know, he just got called for fouls that maybe he wouldn't normally get, um, and maybe that's been a, just a step slow from not having had a week's worth of practice under his belt. But uh, although he did a nice job uh, in the end, maybe the four fouls 
it is a real bonus for us down the track because he, he gets to get 11 minutes break where he doesn't normally get that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes foul trouble can, can be an issue. Sometimes it can be a bonus. And I think I think in the longer run, tonight's foul trouble will be a bonus for him. What do you see from this guy? A career high 11, or tying a career high 11 assists for Emmett Nard, just one turnover. I mean, it just, it looks like he's so much more healthy than he was earlier this year. I mean, he has a burst of speed back, it seems. and Yeah, yeah. Um, as That's fast as he is, anyway. I don't know. How, he looks like you're getting ready to make a cheeky comment there. Yeah, right? well, <laughs> I could say that his uh, his practice this week was limited. Yeah. Um, but no, he, look, he's good. He get it get it on the floor. You know, makes good decisions. You put the ball in his hands. And you trust what he's going to do. Uh, it's rare that he turns it over. And as I said you know, tonight. His penetration really drew a crowd, and which we knew it was going to. That's the that's the way they play. D. You know, they're going to be heavy converge, and and that means Emmett can throw the thing around the gym and. Um, he said, that obviously, his running mate and Dane got a couple of layups off it, and uh, you know threw it back out to Calvin. And it, it's, um, I guess, it's like it's like watching practice five on zero when the ball's in his hands. You, you kind of know where it's going to go, and and it's always going to go to the right spot. And that's uh, that's that's why we trust him. Third matchup with BYU looms on uh, on Monday, and of course we know what happened in those first two. Uh, and I think we kind of saw what we expected in that LMU game, just one bench point for BYU. Yeah. But they're starting five. I mean, when their guards get rolling, they can be really tough to stop. Yeah, no doubt they're um, they're reliant. I mean, they get what they get out of Mika regardless. So you sort of say, say that's probably probably given us going to be twenty points there. It's can you limit the, the guards? Can you? And it's the three guards. It's not just uh, Hawes and Emery. I mean, Bryant is certainly. You know, he had a late start to the season off injury, and he's starting to ramp up his offensive output as well. Uh, he shoot the ball a lot better than what he was when we played him in game one. Uh, that was his first game back. You know, he had 39 or something against Portland a couple of weeks back in uh, in the season. Um, so they've you know, got three good perimeter scorers, um, two outstanding shooters and one really good shooter, and then they got Mika down inside. So, uh, you know, they've got Childs who runs around and cleans up, cleans up any mess, so... Yeah, it's going to be a tough one. Um, obviously, they, I haven't seen the tape yet, but by the look at the scoreline, LMU must have figured a way, A, to score. I mean, to score 81, LMU to score 81. And uh, you know, they didn't stop them so well. They gave up 89. But, but you know, that's the way BYU play. They're going to run up and down. They're going to shoot it. They're going to shoot early in the shot clock. They're going to shoot shots you don't expect, um, which means our bigger guys are around the glass. They've got to be really, you know, really cute. You know, the shot could... They're the tough ones to rebound when you're not expecting it to be shot. And you know, anywhere anywhere inside the half court's fair game for Horse and Emery. As usual, it's so much of this matchup comes down to controlling the tempo because yeah. you're looking at two opposite teams in that regard. Yeah, not, I mean, not, not that black and white, but no, no, but that's but, how it is. I mean, they right. they they want to they want to push and they want to they shoot threes in transition. They want to get out and run and want to you know, get dunks and offensive rebounds and that kind of the thing that, that excites them and. We'll do all that too, but we we have an in between game, and they they tend not to want to play in that that in between section of the of the of the shot clock. Now they want to get all done early, and and if you can frustrate them and, and not let them get back to back quick scores, because that's the thing that really gets them going when they can score two or three points uh, trips it in a row quickly. If you can get a stop and maybe a, a score, and then a, then a, another stop and a long score rather than a quick one, it just takes them out of what what they feel comfortable doing. Day off tomorrow get some practice in i'm sure watch a bunch of film for yourself absolutely yeah. um yeah no there'll be certainly some film watch tonight and and tomorrow it's uh yeah look in some some ways it's good to get a day off i think we our bodies need it and uh it certainly gives us a chance to get a really good scout done on, on byu no question well thanks for joining us once again okay. marty and we'll no uh, we'll talk to you on monday okay thanks Ed. marty clark brought to you by Shamrock Office Solutions, proud partner of uh, St. Mary's Athletics. Shamrock Office Solutions, diver delivering digital copier and technology solutions to the Bay Area for over 15 years. Visit them online today at shamrockoffice.com as uh, Emmett Nahr makes his way over. Uh, tying a career high with uh, 11 assists tonight was Emmett Nahr. Two of eight from the floor, four points, 11 assists. A pair of rebounds, and he joins us now. Let's get this out of the way. Uh, the W.TV came out, obviously, with a special Calvin Hermanson knocking down three after three. You were wearing a purple dinosaur outfit, it looked like. Do you own that, or was that brought for you? Uh, yeah, it's one of my four different dinosaur outfits. <laughs> what are the other colors? 
Uh, well, that one was purple. I have a nice bright pink, bright yellow, and bright orange. What made you go with the purple? Uh, I don't know. First one I saw today. <laughs> <laughs> Did you bring any to Vegas? Uh, no, no. Oh. Not to Vegas, That's unfortunately. Too bad, man. That's too bad. Yeah, it wasn't room. Yeah, well, and maybe next time. Yeah. Maybe next time. I mean, I heard you throwing some good Pokemon jabs out of Calvin in that one, too. Yeah, I did. I, I feel like that probably hurt him pretty deep. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, what didn't show, I mean, he didn't miss many. No, he doesn't, you know, <laughs> which is a good thing he made. Made me look pretty good tonight. Well, he showed, he hit, fifth, he hit five tonight. I mean, and I just talking about, I mean, it looked like, uh, for the most part, him and, you know, you guys in general tonight really let the game come to you on the offensive side. Yeah, um, well, they really mixed it up a lot with how they were guarding us. Um, so we didn't really want to force the issue because eventually if we move the ball enough late in the clock, we're probably going to get an open one. You know, the way they were playing, scrambling around, uh, you can't really keep that up for a, a whole possession. So we just sort of tried to move the ball a lot, and guys like Cal and Tanner were getting open and making shots. Yeah, I think you knew you'd probably have the advantage inside, and it seems like Jock just kind of wore him down there, down the stretch in the second half. Yeah, and they're, they're – Big guy got in foul trouble as well, so they didn't really have anything, anyone that could match up with him. Um, it just is another look for us, the inside-outside game. And when he gets it rolling, then it makes it easier for us on the outside to make our shots. So he could. Yeah, how about the depth and versatility of your lineup? Because this was a matchup where Kyle Clark could be used, and he came in there and really had an effect like he did – the whole year last year, I mean, his limits, you know, his minutes have kind of been eaten into because, you know, Dane and Jock play at the four and five so much this year. Um, and he seems like he's taking it all in stride. But, you know, Kyle got in there, and, boy, there were a few rebounds there in the first half that he tracked down. There were tough boards that, that gave you guys extra possessions. Yeah, Kyle's big time for us, and he has been all year, and he was last year. He's sort of someone that goes a bit unnoticed, you know, with what he does. He just plays hard, like you said, gets those rebounds, uh, had a big three in the corner. You know, he, he's he's huge for our team. And last year in the semifinal, this tournament, I think he had a big game against uh, Pepperdine. So, you know, he plays in the big moments and when we need him. We really we don't take him for granted what he does for us. Take me through the highlight reel play you had when uh, Jazz Johnson knocked the ball out from behind. And you're kind of loose. looked like you were losing your center of gravity, kind of falling in the lane, keeping the dribble. And you go behind your back to jock for the end one. Yeah, that was, that was pretty lucky to get the dribble back because I was a bit stuck there for a second. But uh, I was falling over on purpose, obviously. Of course. So, yeah. yeah, so I could set myself up. Yeah. Um, really, I had no other option, sort of. I'd fallen, and luckily the defender jumped, and I just tried to get it to jock any way possible. Hopefully it looked pretty cool. I think it looked pretty cool. I mean, you'll probably see it on the highlights tonight when you turn on Sports Center, and you'll probably see it on Brian Navarro's highlights on uh, – on the website, Which so is, that's the most important thing. That is the most Brian Navarro's highlights. Brian Navarro makes the best highlights. Yeah, I think. world yeah. famous. Incredible, mm -hmm. incredible. Shout out Brian Navarro if you're listening. <laughs> he, well, he will be listening to this at some point, and this will probably make, uh, you know, the rounds on YouTube. So there you go. I oh, mean, awesome. It, we want to make sure credits given where credits due here. I mean, exactly. Yeah. Credit to Jazz Johnson too. Twenty six points. And I mean, he was a handful and. You know, may I, I know it's that time of year where everyone's kind of banged up a little bit. I don't think anyone's 100% healthy on, on really any team. But, uh, you know, Jazz Johnson had 26, and Joe, of course, drew a, a, a tough assignment. But maybe a good night for Joe to get 11 minutes off tonight at just 29 after banging knees against Santa Clara. Yeah, exactly. Um, Jazz played pretty extraordinary. He was keeping him in it for a long time. Um, it's good to get Joe some rest. He's playing 37 minutes a game, you know. Yeah. Come the 30th game of the season, it starts to take a toll on your body, so – if he can get some rest, maybe he fouled on purpose just so he could get out. You know, you, you never know with Joe. He's pretty smart like that. Well, he, I mean, and to his, I mean, he never comes out. And, I, you know, I, that's what concerned me in that Santa Clara game because I see him looking toward the bench saying, hey, I need to come off. I mean, he's as tough as they come, and he doesn't, he doesn't want to come off. He wants to stay in there and compete. But it was good to see him out here again tonight, you know, uh, against Portland because, you know, him and you together just, you, they do so much for this team, control the pace, and, uh, you know, obviously he was the defensive player of the year. I mean, he means a lot. Yeah, it makes makes it a lot easier on everyone's lives, him out there playing defense and giving us another look on offense. So, uh, you know, we'll need him big time for these next uh, this next game and if we win that, the game after that, and then any other postseason games we get. So, you know, I'm sure he'll, he'll be ready to go when we need him. Brian Navarro, by the way, is listening. Oh, hey, Brian, how's it going? Yeah, Brian, he's got the headset in walking around somewhere. It's about a minute delay, so 
he'll get all this eventually. You oh, know, nice. but he's he's making sure I know that we're listening, or he's making sure we know that he's listening. It's been a long, it's been a long day. I'm, I'm glad he's listening because Saturday night in Vegas, you know, Brian could be anywhere. He could be anywhere, yeah, he's, but luckily he's he, right here with us in the Orleans Arena. Exactly. Yeah, you know, Brian's a bit wild. So, <laughs> uh, last one for you. Looking ahead to BYU. Obviously, you've seen him twice already. Uh, you know, how has the matchup gone your way uh, to the extent that it has in those first two games against BYU, and what is the key to slowing down that potent offense? Uh, I think the key is not giving them any easy baskets in transition and then trying to take away their threes. Um, so today, what they make? Yeah, I had a few threes today, and, and when their guards get going, you know, that's that's when they're at their best. You know, Meek is averaging 20 a game, and, I think he's played well against us the two times uh, we've played him. But he's played well against us. We've everybody. done limiting like Hawes, who's a great player, and uh, Emery. I think that's a real job there. You know, they're gonna heavy heavy feed it to Mika, so we got to stop the other guys from sort of doing doing their job. Yeah, no question. Well, it'll be another fun one uh, between you guys and BYU. Any final thoughts? No, just uh, not sure when you're gonna get this platform again. Yeah, that's true, you know. I'm ha happy I've to be here. I've been campaigning for you. I've been listening to every show. You've been – just want to shout out you and how well you've done all year, uh, you know. I, I, mean, I appreciate that. It's the best that, radio man. show in the country by in, far. In the country. Why don't you tell everyone else here? I mean, we could all use that type of stuff, right? Exactly, yeah. I mean, every little kudos. You know, I mean, well, shout out to you for tying a career high tonight on 11 assists and for being one of my most entertaining guests on the post-game radio. Hey, thanks. That 110 means, boys getting that means it done well, tonight, The 110 huh? boys. Yeah, we didn't have a connection tonight, but – you know, we're still one ten boys stay one ten boys always. So that's right. Well, yeah, that's what that's what Fitz said. Uh, yeah, that's what Fitz said in Provo. Tony Kearns wants to get you out of here. So thanks a lot, Emmett. All right, thanks a lot, AJ. See you, Brian. Emmett Nar, Emmett Nar, our Crown Plaza Player of the Game. As we are joined by uh, Will Maupin of um, SB Nation and Mid Major Madness. He's been around all day. It's been a long day and a half here, Will. I mean, a lot of basketball going on here, and we get very familiar with the inside of the Orleans Arena. Definitely do, yeah. Well, hey, uh, so far in this one, 32-27, uh, the St. Mary's lead. The Gales are shooting 50% from the floor, but uh, this, is, this is the best I've seen Portland play so far this year. Uh, they're knocking down some shots, and they're really staying competitive here. Yeah, they've really, uh, they seem to have turned a corner and figured out how to play. It took them a while, how to play without Alec Wintering. We've got uh, Jazz Johnson hitting some threes there at the end. Hallinan's really come on late and is playing pretty well. Only four points, but he's... Uh, He's a big improvement to what they've been doing lately at the point guard position. Well, I know coming into this year, I mean, Portland was, a, you know, a pick by a lot of people, maybe a, kind of a dark horse pick because the coaches picked them to finish eighth in the West Coast Conference preseason poll. But, you know, maybe a little bit of a dark horse pick to be that fourth team that can challenge the top three because when you look at their roster, I mean, Wintering and Jazz Johnson are dynamic, and then you've got some other pieces there. And like you said, with all the injuries, it's tough to really get set into a rotation and kind of develop a chemistry on the floor, but it looks like the Pilots are finally starting to do that, to your point. Yeah, and if you're going to do that at any time, this is the time to do it. Uh, it doesn't bode well for teams like St. Mary's who have to play them <laughs> right now and get a totally different look, but yeah, this is the best I've seen Portland play in a while. Last night they played really well, but against San Diego, pretty much anybody can do that, so seeing them keep up against a defense like the Gales have is pretty impressive for uh, Terry Porter's squad. Anything surprise you about those two games yesterday? Obviously, had the five-point Portland win, and you had uh, Pacific being Pepperdine. Lamont Murray Jr. goes for 41. Uh, did anything surprise you with those results? Or I mean, those playing games are almost like a flip of the coin at, at most times. Oh, definitely. Uh, I probably would have picked the opposite results to have happened, but I'm not particularly surprised. I think the biggest surprise, and this isn't even that much of a surprise, was Lamont Murray going for that 41. He scores a lot, but that was the second highest ever in the WCC tournament. Uh, I believe the record was 45, but I'm not quite sure on that. So just having something like that happen is uh, a little bit surprising, but I, yeah. Let's run down the results today. BYU beats uh, LMU 89-81, and this was a game that uh, LMU, I mean, they were right in it there in the first half. They led by as many as five, and they even made a run there in the second half. BYU was as up by as many as 14 after they made you know, a couple bursts there, as BYU will often do, but... LMU crept right back into that game and really made it a game in the last four or so minutes. Definitely did. BYU started hot and then uh, went on some droughts. Very back and forth game for them. Uh, as we've seen all season long with the Cougars, coming off of a win, knocking Gonzaga out of that number one spot, immediately go back and play at LMU's level. Uh, it's an interesting thing that uh, Dave Rose has to deal with here. So, yeah, it, that, was a, that was a close game, and it shouldn't have been a close game. 
The biggest thing to watch with BYU is you know, the depth for the Cougars is going to be tested in this tournament when you have when you could possibly play three games in four days and when you go up against two top 25 teams. The Cougars bench today just one point, Will. I mean, that's got to be a concern for Dave Rose the rest of the season. It absolutely is. They uh, they had a couple, they had a streak. I think it was two games where the bench accounted for three total points just a couple weeks ago. So it's no surprise that their bench is not that productive, but it is very deep. They ran, what is that, six guys off the bench? Yep. So he's got bodies. He just doesn't have too much talent there, so they can... They won't get into a position where they need to keep guys on the floor in foul trouble against Gonzaga and St. Mary's, but they don't want to get into foul trouble because they are not bringing serviceable replacements off the bench. Eric Mika did his thing again with 25 points and eight rebounds, just a sophomore. What do you? I mean, what's the ceiling for this guy? He is. I mean, he to most of the WCC, he really is laying waste to it. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, well, everybody's talking that he. It's up in the air. He could go this year. He could go next year. To the NBA, personally, I would like to see him come back again. Yep. I like watching him twice a week, but uh, yeah, he's gonna he's gonna get a look after this season. And if he uh, if he comes back, I think the ceiling is even higher. He could be a potential lottery pick. But right now, he is just probably the best center in the league, which is crazy considering we just watched Shemek Karnowski and we're watching Jock Landale right now. Well, a game that features a lot of uh, perimeter play, Santa Clara and San Francisco, an entertaining one at that. Santa Clara gets the win, 76 to 69. Jared Brownridge stays alive in his college career, 28 points for him. Uh, you would want to talk about guys that are fun to watch. Jared Brownridge in his four years at Santa Clara. Can, I mean, can you think of a guy that's more fun to watch in this conference? Not right now. I, I was thinking after this game, he kind of reminded me of a couple years ago, Anthony Ireland with LMU, another guy, four years, good from the get-go, and you almost don't want to see their careers come to an end in a place like this. So it's good that we get another chance to uh, watch Brownridge. He's going to be playing Gonzaga on Monday, and uh, Coach Mark Few said in his press conference, he was asked about Santa Clara, and he said, feels like we've played Brownridge 30 times. Yeah. So he's been around, and he's been good. And yeah, 28 points, perfect from the line, 11 of 11. Just another quality performance, and he coming up, coming up clutch again. I don't think San Francisco's season is going to end here. They should be in a, in a postseason tournament somewhere with 20-plus wins. 33 for Ronnie Boyce in this one. Where do you see the Dons falling in the postseason picture? And, you know, if they get the right matchups, I'm sure that's somewhere where they could make a run to possibly a championship of a CIT or a CBI. Yeah, uh, they were talking those two tournaments or the Vegas 16, if that's happening. Uh, so they've got those three. They're not going to make the NIT, I don't think. But, yeah, depending on how the matchups go, if the school wants to buy the game, host the game, or if they have to go on the road. Those tournaments are fun because they're all they're campus sites, so you get a lot of you get a really energetic crowd at every one of them. So yeah, they're a team that if, if they face off against a team that is not defensive minded, they can really score with just about anybody. So if they get a good matchup, they can win a couple games. They could, like you said, get to a championship. So it's gonna be fun to keep an eye on them, see where they go in March and some of these uh, less covered tournaments. In your eyes, you know, if Gonzaga doesn't have the season they have, and Mark Few obviously well-deserving of Coach of the Year, you know, losing this first first game in the final regular season matchup, where does Kyle Clark fit in that West Coast Conference Coach of the Year running? I mean, because you're probably looking at three guys. You're probably looking at Randy Bennett, Mark Few, and Kyle Smith. And I'd have to imagine Kyle Smith, you know, without the season that Gonzaga would have, would be a favorite to win Coach of the Year. Definitely. I don't know if you could put him above uh, Randy Bennett, even though what Randy Bennett's doing right now is kind of normal for St. Mary's. Um, but, yeah, Kyle Smith, first year. I think this is uh, San Francisco's third 20-win season since their self-imposed death penalty back in the 80s. To lead a pick ninth in the preseason, to lead him to that is really, really impressive. This is a team nobody saw coming, and they have really performed all season long. Not only that, but they're really young. I mean, a lot of freshmen on this roster. You look at guys like... You know, a couple of all freshman performers and uh, Rotino and uh, Charles Midland, they could be dangerous for, uh, you know, at least a few years to come here. Oh, yeah, and Midland is fun to watch. He is athletic. He gets to the rim. Really, really energetic. He's, he's going to be challenging for some of those all-conference spots, not just all freshmen, but all-conference spots going forward. Uh, and, and finally, Gonzaga beats Pacific 82-50. to 50. That was a close game at halftime, but Gonzaga outscored Pacific by 30 in the second half. It's just amazing to me, Will, how, you know, you see a team like Gonzaga who is clearly a cut above, but the, the fact that they are have the ability to win so many games by 25-plus, I mean, you know, people discount, I think, how tough that actually is. Oh, yeah, if, you, uh, if you're just watching ESPN or something and they're looking for a flaw in this team, they're going to say, well, they're not tested. 
they're not getting tested in West Coast Conference play, but what do you really want? Do you want to get tested night in and night out, or do you want to win as well as you can win? And that's Gonzaga got tested early and then won here by 32. So that's about as good of a way as you can win as far as I'm concerned. T.J. Wallace, 21 points in his uh, final game as a Pacific Tiger. Did take 21 shots, but to me, T.J. Wallace has always been kind of one of the most underrated players in the conference. For how good he actually is, not a whole lot of people talk about him. It doesn't help playing at Pacific that has been That's just kind of really struggling throughout his whole career since they've come into the West Coast Conference. But, yeah, he's, he's a dynamic player. He's fun to watch. Took a knock on the leg earlier today and just played through it, was running up the court holding his leg a little bit, but still kept scoring, still kept putting the ball in the basket. Nigel Williams-Goss, of course, the uh, West Coast Conference Player of the Year and uh, the West Coast Conference Newcomer of the Year. 20 points, 6 rebounds, 4 assists. Yeah, And it goes beyond the box score for him, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. He's one of those guys that if you're not watching the game and seeing how he is leading the team on the floor, you're missing out on a large part of his game. There are a lot of possessions where he gets the ball, looks like he should be out of control, but is perfectly balanced and ones, and just the crowd here was entirely... Pro Zags and would just get them fired up immediately. So he he brings a lot to this team in terms of intangibles that nobody else does. They called Spokane South for a good reason, I would yeah, think. Yes, yeah. they do. Uh, you look at Gonzaga and you know should they get the right matchups? Is, is this a team that can potentially make the Final Four? Absolutely. If they stop this trend of being flat like this, they were flat for a long time against BYU. They cannot afford to be flat. Uh, early like they were tonight against Pacific. I don't think they can afford that against a guy like Jared Brownridge on Monday. Certainly can't afford it against, uh, assumedly, St. Mary's or BYU. Yep. And then in the in the tournament, you cannot do that. But, yeah, if, if they play for a full 40 minutes, they are more than capable of uh, making the Final Four and winning it all. Well, as we, as we wrap things up with you here, Will, uh, let's take a look at that matchup, Gonzaga and Santa Clara. Santa Clara's depth has already been compromised, uh, you know, with injuries and just a short bench in general. But, you know, Jared Brownridge always gives you a chance, and that's all you need. Absolutely, yeah. Jared Brownridge, he's going to come to play. Uh, it remains to be seen if K.J. Fagan will be back. He was out with concussion protocol. And when he came back 12 games, 13 games into the season, their defense really stepped up. If he's back and that defense is there, they might be able to frustrate Gonzaga at least early like Pacific did. That'd give him a chance. But without Fagan, it's going to be Brownridge and uh, company, basically. In this one, the rest of the way, uh, what does St. Mary's have to do to create a little bit more separation? Pour them in a nice push there in the second half. Uh, where do you see the Gales, where do you see the area they need to exploit to maybe blow this back out to a double-digit double lead? They need to get back to doing what they were doing in the middle of that half. They had a 10-point lead for a little while, and then back-to-back uh, -back possessions, Rayhan and Nar, quick trigger on the three. If they just get back to running their methodical offense, they will. They should be able to wear Portland down a little bit more. And then guard the three a little bit better. Jazz Johnson with two late threes. They do those two things even remotely better than they did in the end of the first half. They should be able to separate a little bit. Though not that they'll separate by much with the tempo they use. The Gales lock for the tournament? Absolutely. There's there's no way they're not a lock. You, uh, their RPI is really high. That win over Dayton does get, does get a little worse. Dayton lost today, but that's a huge win. If two of your three losses are to the number one ranked team at the time in the country. I don't know how you get left out of the tournament. It'd be absurd. Tell the people where they can find your work and where they can follow you on social media. Uh, at Will's WCC blog on Twitter, writing for midmajormadness.com. That's Will Moppin, Mid Major Madness. It's a pleasure as always, Will. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Will Moppin of uh, Mid Major Madness and SB Nation. Uh, thanks for joining us again at halftime.